Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to discuss the vaccine trials that are underway and how positive or how long do we have to wait for a vaccine. Both these questions are really yours because the immune system is what you're specialized on. So this is really up your alley. Though of course a lot of things else are also up your alley. Now the vaccine trials are on and while we have heard a lot about the Moderna trials, we don't seem to have heard as much about the other trials underway. So can you give us a brief background of the trials and which phase we are at the moment on? Some to be have seem to have also entered the human trials. So this is, in a sense, let me make a splashy statement. For the first time in human history, we are simultaneously making vaccines by the oldest and by the newest possible methodologies all at the same time. So, um, so what is the oldest possible methodology? Um, the old smallpox variolation followed by Jenner's uh, um, cowpox vaccination, followed by Pasteur's uh, vaccines for a variety of uh, microbial infections. And the simple argument there was, take the microbe that is causing the disease, weaken it or kill it, so that it's safe to be injected, but it will still generate an immune response, and then inject it, get an immune response, hope that the immune response is protective, hope that the immune response is long lasting, and you have a vaccine and either you're famous or you're rich. So that's the old model. Are we doing that for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19? Yes, we are. Um, there are at least two or three um, companies and organizations making that kind of a vaccine by just growing the virus, killing it or attenuating it and injecting it. And Sinovac, a Chinese company, is making that vaccine and is apparently in early phase clinical trials. So that's one end. The second way of making a vaccine is to take components of the virus, particularly components against which the immune response is likely to be protected. That is the outer coat proteins of the virus. So you can make the outer coat protein in a variety of ways. You can mix it with adjuvant. Everybody will remember having taken tetanus toxoid uh, shots. And uh, for those of us who've been brave enough to actually look at the syringe, um, the fluid in the syringe is milky. And it's milky because there's a little bit of adjuvant um, alum uh, mixed with- Alum suspension in which it is So, so it's a suspension. Injected. So basically, you take the viral protein that you've made in a variety of ways, put it with an adjuvant uh, like alum, inject that, and again, hope that you get protective, long-lasting antibodies. And I'm going to keep harping on this protective and long-lasting as we go along. Um, there's a very large group of many, many, many vaccine makers in very, very, very many countries who are trying basically to take the spike protein of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, to put it with adjuvant, uh, to formulate it with adjuvant as a vaccine, inject it, and make a vaccine. And again, at least a couple of those are in early phase clinical trials. So would this be and I'll come to DNA? what I... Is sorry. this be called also as a DNA uh, vaccines? We, we haven't gotten to the DNA vaccine. We haven't gotten to the no. DNA or RNA vaccines. No, 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 no. So, yeah, the uh, proteins at the bottom. so these are the these are the oldest and the second oldest modality of uh, making vaccines, and we are doing both of those for SARS-CoV-2. The third modality of making a vaccine is actually not to put in pre-made viral protein material, which is going to serve as the target for the immune response. Instead, what you do through the vaccine is to give your own body, the genetic information based on which your own body will make the viral proteins in a microenvironment where in the body, wherever you inject it, so that an immune response can be generated. So 
rather than the first two approaches, this category of approaches are approaches where you don't give the viral target to the body as a vaccine. You give the information to the body and let the body make the target and respond to the target. And in this category, so this is the new 21st century category of vaccine design. There is currently, as far as I know, no licensed vaccine made by any of these categories. It's that new and, in a sense, unproven a category, or at least. Well, I think developed it for Ebola, but it really didn't go. Um, into well, it's been developed for a very large number, but yeah. It's been developed for Ebola, but it's ne never been properly deployed in any scale. Um, and there are three subcategories to this general category. Depending on how you give the information to the body of the vaccine for making the viral protein. So one is you put the information for the SARS-CoV-2 protein making into another virus which is relatively safe, and these are adenoviruses or adeno-like viruses, um, and you inject that virus. So what is currently in the news, currently meaning over the last 72 hours in the news, as the so-called Oxford vaccine, um, is the vaccine that is based on a chimpanzee adenovirus, into which information for the SARS-CoV-2 coat protein has been put in, and therefore, when this engineered adenovirus is put into the vaccine, the vaccine's body will take the information and will make the SARS-CoV-2 protein and will generate an immune response against it. So the second is, category is that... This is also, of, apart from the Oxford virus, one of the ones which are being under in, in clinical trials at the moment, is also a Chinese vaccine. Which that's is also correct. Using in fact, in fact none of the examples that I'm using are unique to any one group. Anyone. So multiple people are growing the virus, multiple people are making the viral protein, multiple people are making all sorts of adenoviruses, mostly adenoviruses of different kinds, carrying the information. Because and the fourth Oxford category is... Sorry. And the CanSino group, both of these were actually one of the early uh, enlistments in WHO for the clinical trials. That's correct. So uh, the fourth group category is of DNA vaccines, where again, instead of putting the genetic information for viral protein making into, a, into another carrier virus, you simply take the DNA appropriately configured and you inject the DNA. And if, if you've done your, your formulation correctly, that DNA is used again by the vaccine's body to make the viral protein and, and to make, generate an immune response against it. And the last category, which is exemplified by Moderna, is since DNA is converted into RNA, is copied into RNA, and then RNA is copied into a protein, rather than giving the viral protein information as DNA, Moderna is giving the viral protein inf information as RNA directly. And again, letting the body make the viral protein and respond. So, so those are the categories. And in each one of these categories, there are a large number of people who are trying to make vaccines the world over. So adenovirus, RNA, or DNA vaccines, all these are, in that sense, new vaccine making? Have not been tested earlier? Um, yes. As you pointed out, uh, there are a couple of examples of adenoviral vector vaccines that have come close to being deployed. DNA and RNA vaccines uh, um, uh, haven't come that close. But all three modalities have been under development and investigation for, oh, easily 25 years. Okay. So in the laboratory, they are not novel. As a matter of fact, none of these approaches is particularly novel because many of them are simply repurposed from um, earlier candidate vaccines that uh, uh, went a certain distance and then didn't go further because there didn't seem to be any demand for them um, and have simply been repurposed for... Uh, they originally uh, started with SARS as the target. SARS, and MERS, to MERS and Ebola. Ebola or, but none of them lasted long enough for them to really get into full-blown 
clinical trials and then come out with a successful version? Well, he, he, to be honest, um, they lost capitalist value. Lost capitalist value. And therefore, did not go further. Ra and I would insist on that rather than saying that they lost societal value. I don't think they lost societal value, but what they did lose was what I'm uh, fact, what calling capitalist value. Follow, in fact, following what on what exactly you have said, that expecting a coronavirus pandemic after SARS and MARS, this should have been funded. So we are ready, at least well before it hit us. So we got a 10 year, more than 10 years time for preparing ourselves, which you don't seem to have used. Well, um, okay, so, so, so let me do a little disagreement. Um, yes and no. Um, and the no, and my, my point of disagreement is because I think in fact, that the actual technologies that are being deployed were in fact technologies that were developed and publicly funded, mind you, um, uh, with taxpayer money in pretty much every country. Um, uh, and, and, and the technologies were developed uh, in the laboratory far enough that in fact we were ready technologically, which is why all of these in a matter of weeks, not even really too many months, have come out of the laboratory and have gone into clinical trials. What, we, what I agree with uh, in your statement and that what we have not prepared for is the downstream. Who will manufacture it? How will we put together sufficient, accredited, safe manufacturing to scale so that we deliver the vaccine to communities across the world as they need them without forcing them to pay through their noses for it. This component of a human response to a pandemic, we have not learned at all. And okay. that's where we are going to arrive by the end of this year, where the laboratories will have done using publicly funded uh, um, resources, what they are promising to do. And then we will begin to fall on our faces because we have not done the economics of technology dissemination. Which is where the, <coughs> the virus wars seem to be shaping up with Trump saying warp speed, nothing to do with China. We do not accept WHO's premise. It should be available publicly and so on. But we'll come to that a little later. So coming back to the the, the kind of vaccine development that you talked about, and three of them are currently in the clinical trials, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sure more are, but at least three have been talked about. One is the Moderna vaccine, one is the Sinovac vaccine, and the other is the Oxford vaccine. Coming to the Oxford vaccine, because you talked about the last 72 hours news cycle, that was also connected to uh, AstroGenca, which is a British company, and also to Serum Institute in Pune. They seem to have had a tie-up. So the failure of the Oxford vaccine trials, at least partial failure, do you think that is no longer now a candidate? No, I think that it's a candidate. I wouldn't call it a failure. Um, so let me clarify, since you bring up the detail of the Oxford vaccine, um, essentially, the most likely expectation from pretty much all of these vaccine approaches that we talked about is that all of them will work to a certain extent. Meaning, will they generate some degree of protective antibodies and protection? The answer, I suspect, will be yes. And that has, in fact, been borne out. Some in the monkey experiments preclinically, some in both the monkey experiments and the initial small handfuls of humans who are immunized with them. That antibody responses have been generated that, are, uh, that have protective properties. And um, in the monkey experiments, there is actual protection. 
However, and that's where uh, the qualification about the Oxford vaccine uh, appears to begin, um, is protection a yes, no phenomenon? And no, it's not. So essentially, what seems to be happening is that in the Oxford uh, vaccine monkey experiments, um, unless I'm misunderstanding the data, um, there is clinical protection, meaning the monkeys don't become diseased. There is virological protection partially in the sense that um, the lower lung load of virus is substantially lower, but the viral load in the upper respiratory tract does not seem to have gone down as dramatically. Now, um, what this means, if it means anything at all, um, either in terms of success or failure, is quite unclear. But I would think that the likelihood is that as a first generation vaccine, this is going to be as as successful as the Sinovac vaccine or as successful as the, uh, as the Moderna vaccine or, or in, indeed any of the other vaccines. The I don't think that we should be expecting too much of any of these in the, what I'm calling, a series of first generation um, COVID-19 vaccines that will begin to come out by the end. The Moderna and the Sinovac vaccine seems to show that the monkeys did not get infected that when they were infected later by the actual virus. Yes and no. Um, again, um, it's not clear to me that the monkey experiments in the Moderna and the Sinovac uh, vaccines were as extensive as those for the, uh, for the Oxford uh, vaccine. Um, and both of those showed substantial reduction in, in, in virus load. Um, so it's all, you know, give or take a little bit, it's all comparable uh, and they're all within the same ballpark, I would think. At the moment, so At you the think moment. that the okay. Oxford okay. vaccine is still very much in the race? Absolutely. Okay. So the question is, we have three candidates in the race who have gone to a certain distance. Others may have, that we haven't received enough notice about them, partly because they may not be as well connected to media or needing the share price boost, which some of these companies seem to do. So there is obviously both these angles playing here. But we would say at the moment, probably there are six to eight candidates which, are, which have started running in terms of what would be called the, the two class of trials that are there. So uh, both these vaccines, both this, this set of vaccines and a few others are doing clinical trial one and two. Now, what's the difference between the one and two series of clinical trials? Yeah, so um, keep in mind that um, all the preclinical work that we are hearing about falls into two categories before I get to the clinical trials. The preclinical work is immunizing animals, uh, getting antibodies from them, and testing to see whether they have protective properties. This is universally true. So there's a hundred and something vaccines registered in clinical trial registries across the world for prospective clinical trials. And I suspect that at least in two thirds of them, if not more, um, the simple experiment of immunizing small animals with them uh, mice, rats, uh, rabbits, guinea pigs, uh, and finding antibodies with protective properties um, have been successful. So that's one. The monkey experiments, which is where you can actually look for protection because you can infect the monkeys with SARS-CoV-2 and look for um, quasi real life protective capacity of the vaccine have been done for much smaller numbers, in part because monkeys are expensive, not easily available, in part because uh, centers which do monkey experiments using SARS-CoV-2 are even rarer, so, so groups are lining up and uh, on a wait list for this. So those are this handful that we are talking about. In the clinical trials, 
The first stage of clinical trial is to take relatively small numbers of people, certainly less than 30, usually about a dozen or so. Um, and the formal question you are asking in a phase one clinical trial is whether the vaccine is safe or not. So the primary stated um, intention of the clinical trial in its first phase is simply safety, not either um, it's the ability of the vaccine to generate an immune response, leave alone the ability of the vaccine to protect. Okay. However, since you are immunizing a few people, you will take blood samples and you will test those blood samples to see whether there are antibodies and if there are antibodies, what the prote protective characteristics of the antibodies are, if there are any. And it is from those very tentative preliminary results that we are hearing noises okay. all over. So this phase two clinical trial will be with larger numbers of people and will begin to ask questions about does the vaccine reliably generate a protective immune response? I have, no, I have as yet not formally heard that any of these trials has begun phase two, although I may be uh, behind hand on my information. Um, I do expect that within a matter of weeks, people will start phase two clinical trials. And in fact, as I said, some of them may have started them already, but we have no results certainly from phase two clinical trials as yet. And it is in the phase two clinical trials that the ability of the vaccine formulations, the vaccine candidates, let us call them, to generate an immune response that looks protective will be tested. Whether the vaccine in fact protects against actual SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 disease or not will be in a yet further stage of the clinical trial. And there, depending on what the incidence of infection in the community is, very large numbers of people may have to be recruited for those trials. That's a phase three trial. That's a phase three trial. And it's in those situations, uh, it's with respect to those situations that people are now talking about controlled human infection models for rapidly validating the protective capacity, the actual protective capacity of vaccination, where you will take relatively small numbers of people vaccinate them, give them, deliberately give them infectious virus with appropriate safeguards, and therefore ask whether the vaccine protects or doesn't protect with quick, definitive results from relatively small numbers of people, but with some amount of risk. So that's the something which is new. This is not a normal vaccine development program. No, the, the controlled human infection model, uh, CHIMS as they're called, uh, has not as yet been used to license a, a, any, any um, vaccine currently in the market. All vaccines currently in the market have, be, have followed the conventional phase one, phase two, phase three trials that we talked about. So when you talk about the phase three trials, that takes the longest time? Um, it takes the longest time for a variety of reasons. Uh, large numbers of pe uh, people are required for statistical reliability, and you have to wait for long enough for natural infection incidents to accumulate large numbers of uh, examples of disease in both vaccinated and uh, placebo groups. So it can be about three months, four months, six months? Oh, I can imagine that if by then across the world, uh, transmission efficiency of COVID-19 has dropped substantially, uh, phase three may take uh, longer than that. So that's why we are talking about the controlled, controlled human infection human. model. Human infection model. That's the reason. Yes. Okay. So if this happens, say, what the United States is saying, they'll have a vaccine by fall. We still have the question, 
of scaling up production. We are not entering into the issue you have raised, whether it will be available at a price which people can afford, particularly the global community. This is, of course, the battle which has been now just fought in the World Health Assembly, as you are aware of, and United States and the UK being particularly unhappy with WHO more or less throwing its weight behind the argument, and which India is also a party to, that this should be a global public good, which Chinese Prime Minister President seems to have agreed to. So do you think that this issue of scaling up production, before we go to the in who controls that, <coughs> scaling up production, particularly if it is the old-fashioned vaccine, will be simpler? Um, actually, surprisingly, scaling up production is easier with the um, what I call the newer category of vaccines. The adenoviral vaccine, the DNA vaccine, the RNA vaccine, these are paradoxically far easier to scale up. In fact, as you go from the newest method modalities of vaccine design to the oldest, um, scale up becomes technically more and more and more difficult. Um, in fact, that's the major reason why so many companies and organizations and groups across the world are trying uh, to make vaccines in these relatively new, um, unproven, I suppose you could say, modalities, because scale up is going to be much easier if and when one of them, or more and more than one of them. But existing facilities that countries have, for instance, the Serum Institute, or the Hafkin Institute, they cannot produce live, vac live or inactivated vaccine oh. in the existing scale. So, so none of the technologies is difficult in the sense of uh, um, uh, these biotech uh, um, uh, industrial organizations being unable to absorb the technology. It's simply that the, uh, so there's a built-in limitation. How much virus can you make in one liter of tissue culture is a limited. So it's not so much a matter of knowing how to do it. It's a matter of how many millions of liters and um, is simply the physical infrastructure of scale. And, and that's going to be, for example, Sinovac's problem. In, uh, to, sorry to interrupt. Sati. In, you have in, to build it anew? It has to be built specifically for this purpose? Existing? No, it doesn't. But uh, keep in mind that if we are talking about a global demand uh, over a very narrow window for vaccines, we are going to need more doses of vaccine per month than we have ever imagined. Okay. Um, and it's in that uh, scale um, leap that um, making whole virus inactivated vaccines is going to, I suspect, run into scale up difficulties. Um, and that's where the RNA and the DNA might, in fact, um, be a little easier for scale up. Okay. So, what you were saying is that, in that sense, the advantage to scaling lies with the newer vaccine technologies. So, it's not very surprising efficiencies of the newer technologies tend to be higher than older technologies. So in that's a sense, in a sense, yes. Okay. So if this is successful, say, in the human trials, phase three trials, and if the uh, controlled human infection strategy works, so do you think a target of, say, fall, as the US, Americans say, or September, October, is realistic? Right. So um, uh, let me say something about um, uh, benchmarking and decision making. I think it's entirely possible if the pandemic continues to um, worry the world as much as it is worrying the world currently. It's, I think it's entirely possible that uh, regulatory authorities across the world will accelerate approval processes so that 
with evidence of immunogenicity, meaning that the vaccine generates an immune risk and antibody response, and that the antibody response in laboratory testing has protective properties. That much might be eventually approved as sufficient for licensing. I don't know this, but it's, it's at least possible. Beyond this, there will have to be a formal clinical trial for the infection, which would be the, uh, the orthodox way to go or the controlled human infection. Regardless, do I think that by autumn, fall as the American scholar, um, we are going to have a vaccine rather than a vaccine candidate? I doubt it. Um, do I think that we will get there by, say, next January or so? I think that by next January, uh, we will begin to see the first clear, unambiguous results that multiple different vaccine candidates um, do detectably well in protecting. So my guess is, I, I, I suspect a little uncharacteristically I'm being a little optimistic, but my guess still is that by um, uh, early next year, we will begin to see these data. I doubt seriously that we are going to see the unambiguous data which allow regulatory approvals by the coming on. Okay, and the last question, if we have it by end of the year, beginning of next year, then parallelly we could scale up production so that when it hits us, that means we have this vaccine, scaling up should be relatively faster. So um, you mentioned that the Serum Institute of India, um, which is one of the world's major generic vaccine suppliers, uh, has a tie-up with the uh, Oxford Vaccine Development Group. And that tie-up, in fact, uh, is an interesting one aimed precisely at what you're talking about, which is preemptive scaling up. Um, and the interesting part is the preemptive part. By and large, you would begin um, uh, partnerships of this kind, you know, almost franchising partnerships of this kind for scale up across the world in multiple centers when you have a vaccine that's working. Okay. Um, and, and in that sense, I'm pointing out that what's interesting here is that this is a preemptive scaling up okay. in the sense that the Serum Institute is um, investing in a speculative scale-up of the Oxford vaccine. At least from their, from their own description, that's what it sounds like. Yes, in fact, they've said that we can afford to spend the money because it's our money, we don't need any approvals. So the Punawalas have said, this is okay for us. Yeah. And as you point out, they are one of the largest in the world in terms of generic manufacture. AstraZeneca is an interesting case because this is why the UK government has been against the patent pool or the, in the vaccines being declared as public good as much as Mr. Trump. So always have the flip side of uh, public funding in terms of the Oxford vaccine is publicly funded, but it then becomes privatized through AstraZeneca and then of course not available to the rest of the world. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, so uh, keep in mind that AstraZeneca wasn't born as a UK company. Um, it, it, was a, it was born, unless I'm mistaken, as a Scandinavian company, but uh, uh, you know, with, with multinationals, uh, the point of origin becomes pointless after a while. But, but the fact of the matter is, that this is not really to do with uh, Moderna or AstraZeneca. It is to do with the broader, um, both practical and ideological commitment of how governance and um, major industry um, in Western uh, political economies 
are configured to be complementary to each other. So the, uh, the, the US and the UK governments will in fact point out that their public sector uh, contribution of science and technology development is in fact intended for uh, the marketplace to take advantage of. Um, so is, there, is, there is an element of the generic ideological fervor involved in, in their positions as well. And of course, the fact of the matter is that what they will do is um, sufficient negotiation that their national population will have um, some reasonable access built as in, in return for their support of these companies in the international arena for uh, intellectual property right protection. So it's going to be a complicated dance of who's trying to get what advantage for which corner of their own. Um, and I suspect that the straightforward position that we are spending public money across the world in trying to deal with a problem that's worldwide and that therefore we should simply, all of us get together and spend whatever money is required to make the solutions available across the world. That apparently commonsensical point is, I suspect, uh, going to get subjected to a major barrage of special interests. It's interesting. The Salk vaccine, if you remember, Johannes Salk, Salk was asked exactly this question. Are you going to patent it? And he said, can I patent the sun? So it belongs to the people. The Salks are no longer the ones who are developing yeah, even, you know, ban Banting purified insulin and... Uh, yes, earlier. In fact, he said, the same thing. He, he, sold, he gave the patent to the University of Toronto for $1. Yeah. And uh, when he was asked, he said, it's not my insulin, it's, it's, it's everybody's insulin. Yes, and that actually comes before SOFC. So, right? you know, there, there, are, there are different ways of looking at this. Yes, but... And I'm that's where we are going to be. Those are going to be the major wars. Um, in boardrooms across the world um, come next year. Yeah, and I believe, Satyajit, that this will be a repeat of the AIDS wars. And ultimately, the fact that once you know that this works, repeating it is relatively easier. And therefore, that compulsory licensing to other mechanisms will also come into play. So I don't see that this will take 10 years, which is what AIDS, back, AIDS drugs took before it became accessible to the poorer sections. I don't think it's going to be that long, but that's a hope. Let's see where it actually- I agree with you. Let me add something to what you said that may be interesting. And that is, you see, the anti-HIV, anti-AIDS uh, um, drugs were being developed in relatively small numbers of laboratories, primarily distributed in the developed world. Here is an extraordinary distinction that I think we in India, and in fact, we across, let me say, the global south, should not lose sight of. And that is, we have friends and colleagues in laboratories of the global south who are making SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 vaccine candidates using exactly the same methodologies and technologies that are being used in these other places. There are a bunch of efforts in India, for example, to make vaccines by one or the other of these methodological categories that we talked about. And my argument is that we need to be heavily supportive of these efforts because they underline a major tactical point. So this is not about their necessarily succeeding and making great um, vaccines that will go up. I hope that they do. 
but it's but my support is not dependent on that i am arguing that we should be supportive of those because it undercuts patent claims as and when they begin to get made okay and that i think is and i'm saying this publicly is a critical issue in underlining the point that the state of art knows how to do this the world over okay and therefore we need to be both supportive of ongoing efforts and we need to demand the poorest of us as countries need to demand hey can you support some of our scientists and technologists to try to make a vaccine candidate good so the battle continues absolutely the issue of vaccines which it did over the issue of aids and as i said hopefully it will be much shorter and if we strategically invest in some of the issues you were saying some of the areas of research development as you were saying then we will be in a stronger position thank you satyajit for being with us sharing your knowledge about a rather complicated issue which is of great interest to people as and when such pandemics or other such issues come up this is all the time we have for news click today do keep watching news click and do come back to our, also visit our website Thank <laughs> you.